Well, welcome to the Manhattan Network. Have you, are you from New York originally, or where are you from? In California. Oh, what part? Long Beach. Oh, yeah. I used to teach at Long Beach College there for a year. Lovely weather, I remember. Every day was a beautiful day. But I'm a military brat, so oh, we didn't stay there long. Right. So that's why I recognize Admiral yeah. Zumwalt's name. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, well, that was a long time ago. I could send you a complete list if you wanted. It's pretty extensive. Welcome. Welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to welcome to the program Carolyn Jackson. And Carolyn Jackson is the executive director, relatively newly so, at the a very interesting organization that we're going to discuss today. It's called the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, Inc. And uh, Carolyn, welcome very, very much to Conversations and to Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Well, oh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I wonder if you could share with us. Maybe we could begin at the very beginning and the most basic elementary level, as it were, for the general audience and uh, you know some of the people in the financial world who might be viewing and so forth. But what do we mean when we talk about, we want to talk about the association a little bit down the line, but what do we mean when we talk about a swap? Or what do we mean when we talk about a related de derivative? We'll begin at the very basic beginning principles. And uh, maybe you could share that with us, and then we'll talk some about the association down the line. But what is a swap, and what is a related derivative, and where do they fit into the financial picture of the United States and the world economy? OK, well, that's, those were a lot of issues to take at once. And I'd like to break it down, and I'd like to start very simply with what is a swap. Mm -hmm. And I think before we move into financial terms, I think we ought to just look at where the term swap comes from. And I think that will help people understand when we move into financial terms. Swap is often used among the term among children. If you meet a group of kids at recess, somebody has an ice cream cone, somebody has a candy bar, right. they agree to swap it. That means it's exchange them, right? Exactly. All right, right. And in finance, it's nothing more complex. Instead of having ice cream and candy bar, mm -hmm. somebody may have French francs and somebody may have US dollars. Somebody may have okay. fixed cash flows. Somebody may have floating cash flows, but right. it's, a, it's an exchange, and in finance, the general term is an exchange of cash flows. I see. And why somebody would be interested in engaging in these exchange of cash flows is it allows them to alter their risk profile. Okay, you, right. So I think one of the questions, too, is where does it come from? Who uses it? Uh -huh. Well, really, business corporations and financial institutions. It's a wholesale market product. It's right. not a retail product. I understand, right. And these financial institutions and these corporations are all facing certain financial business risks. Right. And this could be their exposure to interest rate movements, their exposure to foreign exchange movements, and their exposure to commodity price movements. Things that if they're really in the business of making widgets yes. or some sort of product, they want to focus on that. They mm -hmm. don't want to be sitting around worrying what's going to happen to the Deutsche Mark today, what's going to happen to the price of natural gas today. These products allow them to uh, manage those risks appropriately, appropriately, and to hedge against them. So it's sort of a, it's it's a risk management technique is what exactly. it really is, uh, what it's involved. And I wonder if you could, and that's in in a in a world. I, I'll get to why they've come into the picture so prominently as they have, and we'll talk about that a little bit down the line. But I wonder, could you 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 say swap? We understand the idea of swap. You're swapping risk in a we either with uh, floating currency rates or with fixed rates of interest and so forth, or, or... You catch on very fast. Well, no, I don't, really. I'm just trying, I'm just learning here, like probably a great deal of this audience might be as well. But it's trying to get this kind of uh, thing. Now, is there a difference between a swap? You said a swap. We understand you can swap risks and this kind of thing between the partners to a, to a deal. And what is a related derivative? And derivative, again, we could go to the dictionary and say derivative is... Uh, not directly related to the product itself, but is derivative of it. But what is a related derivative, and what's the difference between a swap and a related derivative, and what is the in, uh, what is the uh, association between those two, because they're linked together in your association? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, those are certainly uh, again a lot of questions. Um, the term derivatives has brought with it 
a lot of complications. It's okay. a very, even as you've already alluded to, it's the confusing word. Okay. Swap is not a confusing word. No. And the interesting thing is my association called itself the International Swap Dealers Association until 1993. Uh -huh. And if you take a breakdown and look at the products, the actual derivatives market that my trade, trade association represents, you'll find that 80% of the products that are actually engaged in by these corporations and financial institutions are swaps and exclusively okay. interest rate swaps, not even getting into another format, currency swaps. Mm -hmm. So when we do talk about swaps and other derivatives, it's important to note that the derivatives market, which embraces swaps as well, 80% of that derivatives market is interest rate swaps. I see, okay. And another 5% or so are currency swaps. So as you can already see, swaps are the majority of the product. And also swaps were the product that got started and came to great notoriety in 1981, 1982. All right. And it was sort of in the mid-1980s that we saw other derivative products start to be developed. And these were interest rate options. They were primarily the option related products. Uh -huh. So it's in terms interest rate caps, so swaps interest rates, floors. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I, yeah. I was just trying to get across the point that the swap is the majority of the market and when you want to define derivative, it becomes a little bit complex because you use the same word to define it, uh -huh. but derivative is something that takes its derives or takes exactly. its value right. from a movement in an underlying index or interest rate or commodity price. Uh -huh. So in other words, we need to move back to what is a derivative and we were talking before, it's, it's not in any way a security. Okay. A, a derivative. Some people get confused on that, don't they? With futures and options and so forth, they get confused on that. Yeah, corporations yeah. cannot invest in a, in a derivative. All right. They cannot um, borrow. It's not a way of raising capital. Exactly, right. or okay. investing capital. Uh -huh. It is a contract between two parties who are agreeing to exchange risk profiles. Right, again, back to the fact that uh, elementary, uh, uh, this is a risk management uh, technique that's involved in terms of all of these activities, right? Exactly. Yeah. And a swap is a type of derivative? Is that, am I right in that then? That's right. one of them, right? right? And, and there are a number of other types of derivatives. And that's why it's often confusing because when you say swaps and derivatives, yes. usually we like to say swaps and other derivatives, but quite often just or says related. swaps yeah. and derivatives and uh -huh. makes it sound like a swap is not a derivative, I but, see, yeah. but it is. Now, Ken, you, you said we're talking to the general public here by and large, and when we talk about related swaps and related derivatives and they're individually privately, contractually made between these parties. And then there are other aspects, there are other things that are called like for futures and options and so forth, are sometimes referred to as derivatives. Is there sometimes confusion in the public or even the financial world mind between uh, what other instruments that are called derivatives and what are really and truly fact, as you understand them, these related derivatives as you and I are discussing? And could you make that distinction and perhaps clear that up in the minds of some of the people who might be viewing? Yes, I, I, I can certainly try to. Mm. What all that you mentioned are indeed derivatives, but where we come back, and unfortunately we'll be mentioning the, the trade association again. Oh, by all means, we want to let people know about it. And sure. that's where the distinction is made. Mm -hmm. There are derivatives, there's a broad group of derivatives, and the ISDA, my association, does mm -hmm. not claim to represent all derivatives. I see. We represent what we call privately negotiated bilateral contracts between two counterparties. Now there's a whole other group of derivatives which a lot of people are probably more familiar with and those are the exchange traded derivatives. Mm -hmm. I mean they have been around forever. In yes. fact in the United States they were introduced in the Civil War in the 1860s. Oh wow. But this is a, a way originally on the commodity side the mm -hmm. farmers they wanted to find a way to be able to hedge themselves because their return was going to be dependent on a lot of factors outside of the control, right. such as the weather, such right, as exactly. the land condition. Right. And unfortunately, to al allow them to run their business, which was their farm, they wanted to be certain of the type, how much money their crops would fetch in the market. And have, were those, those were options or future options and so forth, were those referred to as derivatives back as long ago as 100 years ago? I don't so? think people use the term. I oh, think I didn't know. Relatively okay. Right, right, right. But they were, word. in fact, derivatives. It's the exact and it's same. 
product. Exactly. In the minds of many people, they, they get confused between that and what your association represents. Right. Then. And, and the distinction with an exchange traded derivative is one that is traded on the exchange. Yes. And there are very spe specific contract sizes and contract dates. Right. Like, for example, in my world, which is much more on the financial side, yes. the contracts trade uh, have settlement dates every three months in a September, June, Dees, March. Uh -huh. cycle. Uh -huh. So they're, they're less flexible, if you will, whereas the private contract between the two of us, we can agree to settle on any date. Yes. Instead of having a fixed contract size, you uh -huh. and I can agree, like with somebody's business cycle, it, things may start out slow, their exposure, then it may increase, then mm -hmm. it may go way back down, and it's right. very easy to do that if we're two of us are working out a contract together. Whereas on the exchange traded, which is, again, they're very valuable hedging products, yes. there's a distinction there. In fact, most, a lot of financial institutions like to hedge in the exchange traded market, but it's something traditionally that corporates like to stay away from because they want to try to reduce their risk to the bare minimum, mm -hmm. so they'd prefer to have as tailor-made a product as possible. And that's what is possible with the, uh, with the, the swaps and derivatives that your association represents. Exactly. I wonder if I could ask you something. You, this got started, the International uh, Swaps and Derivatives Association got started. In fact, you're celebrating your 10th anniversary now in right. 1995. It's got started officially in 1985. You said the International Swaps Association, it was called originally, yes. uh, got started after 1980 or so. I wonder if I could ask you a question. This, this, uh, we, we, we want to draw the distinction between those other d derivatives and the, the ones that you're specifically interested in here, which are growing so rapidly and so they're so important to the financial arrangement of the world economy, the national world economy. But why was it that this, this, uh, the swaps and derivatives that your association represents uh, be became uh, practical or practicable or, or in, in effect in, around 1980 or so. What was there about the broader world conditions that made this timely in a way that you say the, the older derivatives went back to the Civil War? These are relatively recent. And what was there, did it have anything to do with the uh, going off the gold standard? Did it have anything to do with the World Bank, International Monetary Fund? What were the events in the world that made 1980, say, let's just say as a, a, a arbitrary date, that these became so prominent and so much used and so forth, as opposed to the historical pattern where they apparently were just being born in that period and had not been used previously? Well, uh, you make some very good questions there. S certainly, what was revolutionary about that time period is the financial condition was changing a lot, and that was through just as you already referred to, the gold standard and going off of fixed exchange rates. 73 or so, I think, 74. Yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. And so uh, there was a lot more risk, if you will, on foreign exchange side. Also, in addition to that, in, in the United States, um, you need to keep in mind that it was a period of very high inflation and very high interest rates. Yeah. A lot of which some people today don't really appreciate that rates can get up to 21 percent. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Right. And it certainly convinced a lot of people back then that there was a real need to hedge interest rate risk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And people were looking towards a product or to a product that would allow them to hedge that. Yeah, and they, they hadn't come up with this in the past, or they hadn't seen a need for it, or the inventive mind of man just hadn't come up with the unique, and we want to talk about what exactly happens in a swap, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of that, but they hadn't come up with that in the, the past, but the, these high interest rates sort of mother well, of invention kind of thing, uh, necessity is a mother of invention, and uh, they, they, they came up anew with these ideas, and out of whole cloth in a certain sense. Huh? And you also had to keep in mind that businesses were expanding a lot more internationally at that time, so yes. there was much more of a need to look on the foreign exchange side to hedge, and also communications had changed quite dramatically. All, right. with All a of lot these of things continue, yeah. Right, and yeah. that allowed people to be in touch because, if, if you can imagine, if I have a Swiss franc exposure, my natural offset might be a Swiss company who has a U.S. dollar exposure. Uh -huh. It really facilitates if I'm able to speak and communicate on a regular basis with that natural swap counterparty, yes. if you will. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's the communication that was bringing the market and making it much smaller in a way by having this constant international communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's on the, that's on the uh, currency exchange rates. And then the fact that we have these incredibly high 
interest rates uh, incentivized, if that's the right term, people to begin to think about some new and creative ways of approaching well, well, this problem. Well, just as a fun fact to know and yes, tell, the right. currency swap came first. It did, okay. And it was a product that, in my opinion, really revolutionized corporate finance uh -huh. as we knew it. Uh -huh. Because traditionally, a U.S. company that wanted to be conservative and prudent, if they wanted to raise money, if they didn't want to take foreign exchange risk, they needed to borrow in U.S. dollars. Okay. Right. So, in other words, U.S. companies were limited to the U.S. capital markets. All right. right. But you can imagine that there might be some Swiss investors that would like to invest in the U.S. companies, but they as individuals certainly wouldn't want to invest in um, U.S. debt or U.S. securities and take the uh, exchange rate risk themselves. Uh -huh. And likewise, Swiss companies were following the same sort of prudent guidelines. If they needed to raise money, they went to the Swiss capital markets. And what was very revolutionary about the product is that there were all these pockets of demand for investors to diversify their portfolios. Yes, right. So Reach what, out in a sense, yeah. Right, and yeah. What, what happened, and we're talking about you know, large institutional investors, we're not we'll talking talk. about you and I. No, I understand. And what happened is this was the first time U.S. companies realized that they could go borrow in Switzerland in Swiss francs uh -huh. and then enter into a currency swap whereby a counterparty, presumably a Swiss franc, a, a Swiss company, uh -huh. would agree to pay the Swiss cash flows associated with this U.S. company's debt uh -huh. and in turn they would pay dollars. And then likewise, you would see the Swiss company borrow in U.S. dollars, uh -huh. and they would be receiving the U.S. dollars from the Swiss company, Yes. and then yet they would be paying Swiss to the U.S. So that gave a certainty to the whole contractual arrangement well, that, that we made were, it possible to, yeah, go ahead. We were swapping, I, let's say I will be the Swiss company yeah. and you're the U.S. company, okay. we were swapping each other's debt obligations right. and at a benefit to both of us. And a benefit to both. That's an important thing to remember. This exactly. is something that benefits both. It, yeah, was, right. a, it was a real international a synergy, yeah. arbitrage uh -huh. opportunity to uh -huh. make capital markets the most efficient that they could be and allow institutions to achieve the best and lowest funding costs that they possibly could. Uh -huh. I, as a Swiss company, now borrowing in U.S. dollars, yes. I swap it back into Swiss at right. a much lower rate than if I'd gone to the Swiss franc market directly. I see, right. And that's because I'm satisfying the demand for U.S. investors to hold exposure to Swiss companies. Mm -hmm. So it's a way, talking about the communication mm -hmm. that was already making the world smaller, this product made the world smaller because it said there isn't these isolated pockets of capital markets. Right. There's really one, one world, capital market. One world right. capital market. And this made it possible to, uh, to, to not have to assume the kind of risks that would have been inordinate and made it impossible for that to occur in a synergistically free-flowing kind of way as has been the case since. Or this has encouraged that direction. It, it hadn't yeah. been the case since. And uh -huh. the important thing to keep in mind, I as my Swiss company have my U.S. debt obligation you, as a U.S. company, have your Swiss franc debt obligation, and right. those are two separate legal contracts. Uh -huh. All we're doing is a swap between ourselves. We're not disturbing these debt contracts. Right, right. We're just swapping it yeah. at a way that we eliminate our foreign exchange exposure uh -huh. and get a benefit because we were able to raise money ultimately in uh -huh. the currency we wanted at a much lower rate than yeah. we could have by accessing it directly. So this, this is going to lower the overall financing costs overall, won't it? And mm -hmm. won't it bring the overall financing costs down? And how exactly does that bring that down? How, how does it improve or bring down the cost of financial, uh, you know, the financial cost down? Be, because yeah. um, corporate borrowers are being able to have access to new markets right. Right. where there's an appetite for their debt, yes, and so that they're able to borrow at a much lower cost in a market way, in a free market way. Exactly. Oh, I see. Right. So okay. it's it's going for international market efficiency. Yes. Well, people always talk about you know efficient markets right. and things get priced out. Before there were definite segments because there wasn't a way for a U.S. company to borrow in another currency without taking foreign exchange risk. Yes, I see. So, so there was a trade-off. 
today the, the rate might seem good, but if the foreign exchange rate moves against you, yes, it could exactly. be a disaster. Exactly. Yeah. But this way you could lock it in. And you can't, you can't, you can't, you know, if you're making a big contract, you can't really, you don't want to have that kind of uncertainty in terms of your setting up a business arrangement. You're going to make an investment somewhere. You want to have a certainty that it's sort of like an insurance. It's not an insurance proposition, is it? Is it fair to think of it as like casualty insur insurance or not? It, there's some there's some products in those more the yeah. option products uh -huh. that are are very similar to insurance the exact insurance product. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, an inter interest rate or currency swap is more a, a way of hedging, a way of fixing. Uh, a true insurance product, um, ideally, you never want to have to use it. Like, I see. Let's think of fire insurance. All right, or casualty, yeah. yeah. You don't yeah. want to cash No, you don't want to. You don't want to, but it, but it is nice to have it there. Exactly, it, you know, right, right, exactly. Right. Whereas yeah. with a swap, you've actually locked in something. You've yeah. been able to get certainty yeah. and something you do want to use. Right. I do want to know that I'm getting my um, being able to pay to use Swiss francs at a certain rate. Right, that, that's why right. I entered into the, the swap transaction. And, and so, it, so that it, it came into being partly because of these 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 exigencies exigencies within the international market and national market and so forth. And it came in also because of the increased communication. And it was some uh, people who got together some 10 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, uh, some swap traders who got together with the idea of establishing, maybe we could bring it around to the association mm -hmm. that you're executive director of, the International Swaps and Derivatives Association. They got together and uh, thought we ought to start trying to standardize this or begin to do it. Maybe we could talk a little bit about the institution itself now then. We've talked right. a little bit about swap. Well, the early 80s were a very exciting time sure for the market. And you've already alluded to some of the um, large volume that currently because the product is so valuable it's really taking off but in the early days I mean I remember my boss first telling me mm -hmm. we'll be lucky if we do four trades a month uh -huh. and within a few uh, weeks or so the, the business was beginning to, to grow and by the end of the year there was you know like 10 20 trades a day so there was really but it um, when you had trades, that would have been contracts negotiated? Mm -hmm. I mean, right, okay, right. But in the early, the very beginnings, every bank, this was sort of new. Everybody was trying to s define what would happen in a swap transaction, define the basic terms, set the ba basic standards, set uh -huh. the basic definitions. Right. And since it was fairly revolutionary, not all banks were... Um, entering into the trades with each other, they were entering into trades with their, their corporate clients initially. I see. Right. Okay. Right. And as the product grew, people realized that they were spending a lot of time renegotiating things that basically could have been standardized, and that would have facilitated the, the growth of the market tremendously. Again, just to clear, the, the, the product here that you're talking about is the swaps contract. Right, okay, because that right. was where That's the association the started right, first. Okay, right, okay. Right. Yeah. So it was just... People were sort of reinventing what would happen in, under certain circumstances uh -huh. uh, under these contracts and trying to put together a bunch of terms. And so the idea was, well, why should we continue for each new deal? Because now banks had begun to transact swaps with each other. They said, why, why is... Um, to name a bank, Chase and Chemical, since yeah, they're in the they newspaper just, they right just now. They were on the front page yesterday. Yeah. Why Marge. should we spend, you know, hours at a time renegotiating a new contract Writing for it each all new from swap? The yeah. Exactly, because right, right. every single time the same issues would come up. How do you want to define this term? How do you want to define that term? So a group got together and said, let's just carve out a group of standard terms, and from there, this really ought to help make the product grow because people could then focus on developing the product rather than just on writing, defining writing the Writing contracts, right? Exactly. I mean, you, get, you could write a standard out like a Bloomberg contract for a lease or something like that in the, in the, in the, uh, they have. But you have a standard, you have a, you have a, what do you call it, a common agreement or a standardized agreement it's, it's form? It's called a master agreement. Master agreement, right. And what the industry recognized, and nothing, you know, against, against lawyers, is that a lot of money could be saved by going with one law firm to 
provide the basic guidelines and working as an industry collectively to come right. up with a standard document rather than each firm individually well, doing sure. their own with their own law firm. Sure. To the degree that you can get a generic statement that you can use, you can just save all that time of renegotiating and just fill in the blanks with the, with the agreements that can be done. And so you can spend your time and energy negotiating the reality rather than uh, rewriting, re reinventing the wheel each time you want to do a contract. And, and the association was instrumental in establishing that master agreement that exactly. the members, and maybe we could back off a little bit and talk about who the members are mm -hmm. of the International Swaps and Transactions Association, but that they could uh, agree to, and um, maybe, maybe you could talk about that. Sure. Who are the members of the International well, uh, Swaps and, agree and it, Transactions? It's certainly all the, the major players involved in, in the market, but it's largely the financial institutions, meaning commercial banks, investment uh -huh. banks, securities dealers, insurance companies, also some major corporations, also some uh, law firms, accounting firms, but primarily financial institutions and corporations. You have a three-way you have a three-way uh, pattern of membership. I think there's primary members and then associate members and affiliated members or something. Maybe you could talk about that three-way breakdown mm -hmm. and uh, who they are and what they represent and so whether you could. Yes, yeah, certainly. The the primary members are the financial institutions and what we would consider dealers in the market. Swaps dealers. Right. Uh -huh. I mean, keep in mind that the original name of the association was the Swap Dealers exactly. Association. Exactly. Right, right, right. So those are our primary members and they're the ones who would be able to to be on the board, etc. And they would represent in a certain, if I may, they would represent in, in I saw another figure in the literature that you provided, 40% uh, perhaps are in North America, 40% in Europe, maybe 20% the remainder in, right. in the Far East, um, they, they would represent the leading financial institutions of the world in a certain sense. Is that fair to say? That's, that's very fair to say. Uh -huh. And one of the th things you know, ISDA can be proud of is the growing international arena in which the market is, is, is shaping up. Uh -huh. Because if you took a list at the very beginning, I would dare say it would be a little bit more concentrated in the United States. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so, in, in this, back again to the formation of the institution, these, the, 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 when, when you were first getting started, I don't know if you were in at the very beginning yes. of all, it must yes, have been fun, we all met in a phone booth somewhere down Wall Street or something like that, now where coffee, you know, begins to grow, and then it grows, and then it, 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 the number of people who became involved in doing deals, as it were, or doing these arrangements, grew, I presume, because it, it grew as a new, a new vehicle, a new business uh, practice. Um, the number of people who would, have grow to the, would join the association would grow, I suppose, and it, it went from being a small startup thing to where, as you say, you were doing a few deals at the beginning, but then it grew very rapidly. Right. And then the, 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 the stature of the people who became involved in this business grew. And, the, and more and more major entities around the world grew. I, I, I think that's probably fair to say. Did it, did it grow? Did it, did, was the nascence of this uh, from our major banking institutions? That were, were some entrepreneurial smaller, act, smaller companies that well, dreamed up this idea or got the idea going? Was it a, a Wilbur and Oliver Wright kind of proposition, inventing the new airplane? Or how, what was it? What, where did it come from? Was it the genius of some people at one time having? Uh, Come up with the idea, or where what, did the, the idea association really, to follow? No, the idea itself of, of, of solidifying and building the association, and, and just maybe backing up beyond that, the idea itself. Where did it Where did it actually come from? Was it the genius of one person, or did it come out of a group of people meeting at some time? I'm sorry, the product or the association? The, well, I was thinking, let's say both. The product, the idea itself, okay. initially. Was that the was that did, did that come full blown out of the mind of one particular individual or out of a group of people? And did it come from somebody that was part of a major institution, or did it come from somebody sort of more entrepreneurial that got this idea and just sort of established it in the in the financial reality that is the world? No, I I think is I think as you already uh, alluded to that this derivatives in and of themselves, the concept yeah. is not new. All right. In fact, again. Um, yeah. one of the, the fun things to, to tell about derivatives is that it can date very far back, and the furthest mention I've heard goes back to a Greek astronomer. Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't remember his name, uh -huh. but where he made his mark was in the olives future. No, I see, right, business. right. It was back in Periclean Greece, huh? Yeah, exactly, yeah, right, and right. what he had perceived was that it was there was going to be a bad crop, I right. mean, a bad, bad weather, which would make the crop very bad. And right. so he went to the industrious olive farmers and said, 
how about I give you money now mm -hmm. and I have the right to buy your olives, let's say at $20, right. and the then going price for olives were 10 That was the beginning of it, right? And they said, well, this is great. They thought it was free money because they could not envision a world where olives might be at $20. And mm -hmm. sure enough, mm -hmm. the weather was bad, the crop was bad. He later went back to these farmers. The price is now 30 He uh -huh. says, guess what? Uh -huh. I get uh -huh. to buy all these at 20 uh -huh. So. So the futures market was uh, initiated, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's the and concepts I, aren't aren't new. I hadn't I hadn't realized that the word derivative was associated with that future and options and so forth so so well. You know, I hadn't realized that. But and I think I was thinking when I asked this question about where did it come from in the modern incarnation, as it were. You know, uh, after this 1980 period and when it began to grow and whether that that was a matter. And you say you were there at the. You were one of the founding, uh, when I say founding fathers, founding fathers and mothers of this concept. You know, so I was just sort of the excitement of a beginning of a new idea is usually very exciting and so forth. No, it was, yeah, it yeah. was very exciting. I mean, again, I, I just, <laughs> just to be modest here, mm. on, on my part, this 1982 is when I became involved in the market and uh -huh. I was just out of graduate school. So. Oh, all right. I was very much following the leadership of my boss rather All than right. designing this myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> Who was that? If I may know. Oh, it's Sanjay Sate. All right. This All was right. at um, the Chase Manhattan Bank. And he would have been one of the initiators of this then, one of those. Yeah. But as, as you mentioned, the, the concepts weren't new, and I would say just about every major institution itself was sort of coming up with the idea at the same time uh -huh. and working with their own customers. There was a unique situation in um, Britain at the time where there were foreign exchange controls right. on sterling mm -hmm. and there was a product called the back-to-back -back or parallel loan which uh -huh. is identical to a currency swap. Uh -huh. The only exception being that it was two separate loan agreements rather than a swap agreement. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But again, so the concept wasn't new. Uh -huh. There were various products related to it dating back again, to whether to the Greeks right. or rather to just something due to the fact that there were exchange controls that were prohibiting free trade uh -huh. between Britain and other countries. Right. But it was what you mentioned before, everybody had kind of the same idea at the major institutions because they had customers that were facing the same problems. Right. Rising interest rates in the United States. Well, yeah, but those things had risen over the years. There had been ups and downs in interest rates, ups and downs in currency exchange and everything over the years. But it was just, again, that there was this new in this 1980 period, in this, the growth of this, there was this new um, communications and new possibilities of the communications and so forth. And, yeah. and people were moving what much more the, internationally. Yeah. yeah, all right, right, I mean, exactly. Companies yeah. did want to expand yeah. abroad uh -huh, and uh -huh. be able to manage those risks. Right, and again, it reflects the fact that so much of this was currency, uh, exchange, uh, it's currency deals that were being but, negotiated. But then, um, yeah, from the, the currency swap, the interest rate swap was born. Uh -huh. That's because there was a currency swap being put together, and one side wanted f fixed dollars, and the other side wanted floating dollars. Right, in the currency exchange, yeah. Okay, yeah. but to, um, we haven't really uh, discussed this, but usually the role that financial institutions or my primary members, the dealers, play yes. into this is they stand in the middle on transactions. All right. So in a full swap, what would happen is, let's just say, let's just pick a company. Let's p pick McDonald's. All right. The hamburger dispenser. Yeah, right. Okay, let's pick McDonald's on one side, and then let's pick um, General Motors on the other side. Okay. General Motors and um, McDonald's would not be doing a swap with each other. In the original days at the market, they would have. But General Motors and McDonald's would say, our business is not credit risk. Our, our business is not to understand w whether or not we want to be in a five-year contract right. with this other company. Right. That's when they asked the banks and the investment banks to step in the middle. Yes, so, which is their business. So, yeah. for example, going back to my first institution, Chase would do a swap with McDonald's and then Chase would do the opposite transaction with General Motors. I see, right, right. So, th and it would, but it would link those two. I mean, in, right. in, uh, under you know, behind the scenes, as it were, or something like that. I mean, we wouldn't see it in the in the normal workings of the society. But I mean, it would be, yeah, all right, right. And they would do that. They mm -hmm. would link those two. Right. So, so the the role of the dealers, if you will, is to 
facilitate the business with the end users, and so ultimately they will be matching transactions. It's, right. it's a little bit more complicated right. than sure, that, I'm but sure it is, yeah. fundamentally, yeah. that's what's happening. Yeah, and it's, it, it underscores the fact that these are all things, these are not retail, these are all being done at the institutional banking level and at the financial institutional level. It's not being done at the retail level, mm -hmm. these, these things as far as the transactions are concerned. Now, back again to the association. Uh, was, that, was that the work of a particular group of small group of people uh, and um, maybe you could share with us uh, who was involved in the excitement of that and then as the and then if you could share with us a little bit the growth of the business as it were because as you said your uh, the person you were working with said you would do maybe four deals in a month or something mm -hmm. and then you all of a sudden picked up 10 and 20 and it's growing very rapidly maybe you could give us quantitatively some of the the uh, the amount of uh, of uh, financial arrangement that is involved in these on a world scale and what the dimension of this and the growth and the growth rates, they have incredible growth rates in the swaps and derivatives uh, area of, um, of these are, if you could. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you that um, just from 1994 over 1993, the volume of activity increased 47 percent. Staggering. Yes. Yeah. Yes, right. And yeah. um, certainly um, Currently, one would the amount outstanding is eleven trillion in terms of a measurement called notional principle. Okay, wait a minute. E eleven trillion. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not B with a B. That's not M with an M. That's T with a T. That's just an absolutely incredible amount of. Um, Money. Maybe you can share what is no notion, no notional. Well, yes. In some notional. ways, I'm hesitant to talk about even tossing out things I mean, like yeah, that. Yeah. Well, that that figure is so is is just uh, staggering. Well, I mean, people it, hear a trillion and yeah. think that's the amount of money at risk, but the amount of uh, money at risk is actually two percent. Notional principle is just a way, one way of measuring the volume. That's the total of volume activity. of the deal, right? Exactly. A, yeah, right. It's just okay. it's it's an arbitrary peg, but an easy one that most people understand. Right that if um, I wanted to enter into a currency swap with you, we need to peg the currency flows to some sort of reference point. Mm -hmm. This is the notional principal amount. So if I wanted to hedge a hundred million debt obligation mm -hmm. that I had, a right. hundred million would become the notional principal. I see. But that right. doesn't mean that a hundred million is at risk. Is at risk. Right. No, okay, no, right. it'd be two percent of that number. Uh -huh. At most, two percent. Yeah, but even at that, I mean, in a growth of forty-seven percent, this is some incredible phenomena that's going on in the world society. I mean, uh, uh, the, that that is just staggering. The amount of, I mean, it would be. I saw in some of the literature that uh, maybe you could share with us then that that th this is a a a, um, a a principle that it seems that. A great number of business op operating people, people operating in business and so forth, feel that this is something that is either crucial or absolutely essential to doing business are the benefits that the derivatives, uh, swaps and derivatives derive. Even I saw one person refer to the fact that if companies do not use the benefits of these risk management techniques that the swaps and derivatives represent, that they might be accused of something like malpractice if they don't take advantage of these. I wonder, do, do, do you understand what I'm getting at? It is becoming almost ubiquitous in the, in the arrangements of, uh, uh, of, of the financial arrangement of our, of our financial institutions, or what? Well, it's becoming very much in... From a very small start just 10 years ago is what I'm getting at in a sense, yeah. Right, but it's come very much just one of the, the toolkits in any corporate treasurer or f financial treasurer uh, kit for managing risk. Yeah. And I think your point's well taken that at some point we will see a world where if there was a, a gross negligence in terms of not hedging a risk where there was a product of available to hedge that risk, mm -hmm. I think you will see people held accountable. And there is one one law case where, where that happened, and that was a, a grain commodities um, corporation. But it, it mean, why it's grown so much is it is invaluable, and it's a very flexible risk management tool. I mean, again, we haven't really talked about this, but there was nothing new created with interest rate swaps, currency swaps interest rate option, options. It's just another product out there for changing risk profiles. But it seems new, in a sense. Doesn't it seem new, uh, in, a, in a sense? Uh, well, it's, it's a new product, but it's not creating any new risk. Oh, and I see. Okay. 
but it's a new way of addressing it. Right, and, yeah. the, and if I had an old way of doing it, or uh -huh. if I had a new way of doing it, uh -huh. why would somebody use the new way? Exactly, Because right. it's the, the lowest cost alternative. Uh -huh. let's, let's put it on a, uh, hopefully what will be a simple and clear example. First, I want to caution that when I use this example, it's not to imply that individuals can do this. No, I and understand. This is financial institutions. That but are but right. let's just take an example that most people probably can understand. And certainly, since I got a mortgage a while back ago, yeah. I understand the process. Um, let's take an, a look at somebody, an individual who is looking at getting a mortgage. Right, on a, buying a home. Or okay. And at the time, floating interest rates around 5%. All right. They say, great, I want the variable rate mortgage. Sign me up for that. Yeah. And at the same time, they had the alternative, alternative the interest of blocking. Rate, the, the prime rate you're talking about now? Yeah. 5%? So it flo and floats. They, it's going to yeah. be, it's going to change. Okay. Well, the rate's always changing. The interest Well, you rate could also get a fixed rate. Oh, mortgage. you can get a fixed rate. Yeah, that's right. Sure. You so can. our consumer decided, I want the floating rate one. Yeah. And he's very happy because right. the current prime rate is at five. He thinks this is great. Whereas if he had locked into a fixed rate mortgage, it would have been eight. And one of the reasons for his decision is he thought that the growth rate of the economy was going to be slow. Uh -huh. He thought inflation was going to be low. Right. So surprise, surprise, there's a new election. Uh -huh. There's a new president right. that new, doesn't new care. New guy at the Federal Reserve. It, yes, yeah. exactly. Right. And it looks like we're going to have a repeat of the late 70s. Uh -huh. We're going to see double-digit inflation again. Uh -oh. So here he is with this variable rate mortgage. Oh, right. And he's pretty unhappy about it. Sure. And wishes that he had taken the 8% fixed rate. Right. This is the exact same thing that a company might uh -huh. be facing. Right. So what can he do? This is what I mean by the risks aren't new. This is the same type of risk. He could go out and say, gee, I want to cancel my existing floating rate mortgage. Right. That's going to take time. Sure. Meanwhile, rates continue to go. Exactly. And then he's going to have to renegotiate a whole new fixed rate mortgage, That's which is right. going to have probably different terms, different covenants, different restrictions, right. refinancing alternatives. It's going to be a fairly lengthy and time-consuming process. Yeah, and it's also head-to-head -head negotiating and everything like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Imagine a world where he calls his friendly bank and says, gee, I really want to do a swap. Could you swap me out of my floating rate mortgage obligation? And can I lock in now, since we know rates have already moved up a little bit, mm -hmm. at eight and a half? And basically, the, the financial institution, the swap dealer, could say, done within a matter of mere moments. Uh -huh. So rather than having to go back and renegotiate a mortgage, cancel a mortgage, where the market can be moving on them, yes. you know, minute by minute, right. second by second, right, right. within like a one phone call, he's totally transformed his risk profile. Now, the swap dealer, as you say, you call it swaps dealer like that, uh, he is, going, is, he going to, is he going to have it set up so that he can win no matter which way they go by doing contracts one way, whether the rates go up, he'll benefit, or whether the rates go down? And how is it set up so that both parties to the process can win mm -hmm. in a non-zero-sum kind of way, you know? Well, what, you, what I might... You understand what I'm saying? I, I yeah. do. And what it's, it's interestingly enough, you know, that question comes up all the time. I see, yeah. The swap dealer does ultimately want to match his portfolio. So he wants as many people thinking that rates are going to go up right. as many people are thinking that rates are going to go down. And you'd be... And take a steady amount off the top or something. You'd be surprised. It, people do, different players in the market do have very different interest rate views. Yeah. We just said this, this new election came up, this new president came up, the new guy at the Fed just came up. But what I might perceive as an inflationary environment, you may not. So there, there are differences in perception. Also, there are different restrictions. Uh -huh. Some corporations are required if, if by, their, by the institutions that are lending to them that if they have too much exposure to rising interest rates that they need to find a hedge. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you if that corporation chooses to do an interest rate swap, it's because it was the lowest cost alternative right. to that okay. corporation right. yeah, that they're of fixing sure. right. their interest rate. Uh -huh. So there are different forces at play yeah. why one person might want to, in this case, have a fixed rate mortgage and uh -huh. another person might want to have a floating rate mortgage. Right. Okay. I mean, my and the swap dealer can deal in that universe. And sure. that's what the swap dealer's comparative value is. That's what they're supposed to be doing in the economy, is being able to match these counterparties together uh -huh. in, in some sense. As I said, it's more complicated than sure, that. I'm it's sure like it is, no, yeah. no swap dealer today, because that's 
the world has moved much further than that. But in yeah. the original days, any swap dealer, you could look in the portfolio, and I could tell you, this counterparty is matched against that one, that one, that one. Now, yeah. a four-year deal might be hedged against a four-and-a-half-year deal. Okay, right. You know, a deal for $25 million might be hedged for a deal of $20 million. Mm -hmm. But there are ways and techniques that the dealers have of insulating that risk. And are there people who are particularly trained in this? Is this a new, is this a new discipline in the, the world of financial uh, uh, well education and so forth? Is there a special training that's needed for this? Do they take special training in the business schools now? I know you lecture to the business schools somewhat, trying to bring them up to mm -hmm. steam, but is there, is there an educational role for the people in the financial uh, institutions and in the financial world to be educated to the, to the to the techniques and the realities of this, or does just your normal banking education equip someone to deal with this, or do you need special training or understanding for it? Well, the, the school system has kept up very well, I would say, in terms of where the business has moved to, because now if you go look at a, a general textbook of corporate finance, you will see references to interest rate and currency swaps and, and the option products, whereas 10 years ago, there, wasn't. there was absolutely yeah. nothing. That's, it must be fun to be part of something that's so new, in a sense, you know, I mean, and growing. So, yeah, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was great. and. Um, it, the financial engineering is a term that people use, but there there's no real special education. Just like bef you know before, um, understanding what a stock was, understanding what equity was, mm -hmm. it was the same thing. Understanding yeah. what a bond is, yeah. understanding um, corporate financing structure. Now, just as that was basic to corporate finance education. The role of the interest rate swap and the currency swap. Yeah, that's just an addendum to it in a certain mm -hmm. sense. And it, but uh, do you do you have a role in trying to educate people to the skills that are needed oh, for well, doing this? It, well, it's, uh, well, it's changed or, quite a lot. In yeah. the beginning, you were trying to educate people internally. So yes. at my institution, you spend a lot of time trying to educate the people who are making the loans to market to their products, make, market the product to their customers. And because there was no in-house training program right. that the bank had, so the right. product specialists had to do it. Now, if you go to any you know bank or investment bank, and they have a training program, you'll see that interest rate swaps, currency swaps options okay, are extensively covered. Yeah, they'll, they'll see that they cover that because it's in their interest to cover it and have people who are well equipped with that. Back again to the association, you have a responsibility for you set this what do you call master agreement? That was mm -hmm. one that was done that was able to make it possible for there to be a more uh, a more you know, free-flowing exchange of uh, capital well, and so people forth. people could focus on the transactions exactly, rather than exactly the right. terminology. But are there, are there, uh, have, you, have you been able, is there, is there an ongoing role in terms of developing contractual instruments that can ease that beyond the master agreement? There are more subtleties and more complexities and so forth. And is that one of your ongoing oh, uh, certainly. responsibilities uh, at the association is to try and smooth that over or to, to, to make that a, a, a more... Um, uh, an ongoing process of setting standards that uh, mm -hmm. that the the world can repair to. Well, new products have also evolved. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen the interest rate swap, right. the currency swap. Right. There are also commodity swaps. Uh huh. There are also equity swaps. Oh, that's beginning to come in now, then, right? Yeah, they're not anywhere near as large a market as the interest rate currency. Do you think, they will, you think oh, they will grow? Oh, yes. Yeah, they're growing. Are they growing? They're not growing at forty-seven percent a year. I mean, I mean, that's incredible, right? Yeah. No, because I mean, again, almost every single corporation is fundamentally f um, facing some sort of interest rate or currency exposure. Not all of them would necessarily have the same exposure. To, to commodities, and certainly if you polled, right. which a that number figures. of surveys have, uh -huh. the highest risk that most corporations see is the interest rate risk. Right. And then second is the currency, and third is the commodity. I see, right. Okay, so that, you know, I wonder, is it is it possible to see this as part, I, we mentioned before, insurance, you know, this mm -hmm. being in a certain sense an insurance role, or at least it's establishing a certain degree of surety for the investor or the business, uh, the management, to know that they're going to be operate within a, a, a certain continuum of reality as they extend outward into the future, which is an important part of business planning and so forth. Is there, is there any possibility that this be seen as a, a general movement toward um, insurance or risk management, as it were, against uh, 
loss, business loss, in more general terms, beyond just interest rates or uh, or, um, or or currency rate uh, exchange, you know, advantages. Is there is there a growing tendency to have there be insurance or systems of uh, assuring against business loss that would make it easier for business to be able to operate? more effectively and with greater surety as they thought and projected into the future. I don't know if you can get at what I'm getting at or not. Is there a movement to try <coughs> and un try and take advantage of uh, the ability to create a business climate that is more sure for the management of, uh, of corporations as they begin to project ahead by by setting up new instruments, perhaps, or new new, con new new arrangements that can make it possible for them to know with greater certainty what conditions they're going to be operating within five, ten years, or some months ahead? And is there a general tendency in world finance to move in that direction? And if there is, doesn't that spell, isn't that an important sociological development if that is, is something that is emerging? If you can understand a number of interrelated thoughts I have there. Well. Uh, certainly one thing that I can say in terms of allowing people to operate with greater certainty, one of the things when I was on the corporate dealing side that a lot of customers came to ask for is they would be bidding on a project and mm. they would be competing in terms of bidding on a project. Okay. And quite often if, if you're going to be putting together a, a project, you need to obtain financing, but you're not uh, yeah. going to get that financing until you know that you have the commitment that you are the winner on this. So let's take right, okay. let's take um, a hydropower plant. I mean, right. this, this is type of competitive bidding situation that I used to work on quite a bit. Right. So there'd be a number of institutions that would be bidding on this, and they needed to know what their cost of financing would be. But they're not going to go if I'm competing with three other companies for, to, to get the right to do this project, right. I'm not going to go and lock in some debt because I may not get the project, so how on earth am I going to you know, pay off that debt? Right, okay. So going, be, back, yeah, right. going back to the insurance, but I need to give a bid to the company, and within that bid, I need to know what my financing costs are. And what are. your situation out in the future is going to be, and you want to have as much control over that as you possibly can have. And right. so that's one of the great things about the derivatives arena. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What somebody could do is come and say, gee, I don't know if I'm going to get this project, but I would like to buy an option that my interest rate costs will be no more than 8%. Okay, that's important. Yeah, right. Yeah. And what their downside would be is the cost of that option. Whereas if they had decided to go ahead and lock in 8% fixed rate debt financing, right. let's just happen to, to say if interest rates fell down dramatically, they yes. would be taking a huge loss. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because they would have that money to invest. Let's say rates fell to 3. They could invest the money that they borrowed at 3, but they would have this 8% obligation to pay off. Exactly. Right, right. And so here they're stuck with the whole debt exposure, whereas at least with the option product, it gives them assurance, it gives them a way to plan ahead, plan for their bid, right. but not be stuck with the borrowing if they weren't able to go through to the project. So that is just a step in that direction, then really, mm -hmm. it is a step in that direction, yeah. But, I mean, in terms, again, I, th I do think it's important to keep in mind that what the, why the product has taken off so much is its ease, its flexibility, its lower cost. It's, it's not introducing any new ways the, the risks are all the same, and there were products for people to manage risk. Uh -huh. So before, whether you want to be in fixed interest rates or floating interest rates, corporations were able to do that before. Yes. So it's not necessarily changing corporations. But it's making able it much easier. Get, it's making it much easier yeah. and giving it a lot more flexibility. Yeah. If they feel that they've made the wrong decision and would like to change the structure, they can get out very easily and at uh -huh. minimum cost rather than going before what we said before in that mortgage example having to renegotiate yes. and cancel something. It might never get done if it, it's so complicated. It wouldn't get done. It'd just get it would be like arterial sclerosis of the financial system or something like that. It would get you know it's a anti collect this is like the mev mevacor of uh, of, uh, of financial institutions, clearing up the uh, cholesterol buildup, as it were, in the making it possible to to uh, to have a uh, have a more active uh, financial arena all overall. I wonder. Uh, we were coming down to our last few minutes. It's really interesting to go on at great length. But uh, regulatory is there a regulatory question as far as the government or the government? These are all privately negotiated <laughs> transactions that we're talking about here with your association, which we want to keep in mind. 
the regulatory role of government, uh, the, 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 the role of the, financial, of the regulatory agents, SEC and so forth, what role do they have in playing in this? Should there be or is there a regulatory agency that specifically, specifically deals with the derivatives? Or is that a problem? Should there be? Or do some people, and then some people begin to get confused, maybe uh, they get confused with Orange County having financial difficulties, trying to uh, peg that to derivatives and so forth. Maybe you could clear up some of those for us in this last couple of minutes okay. that we have uh, at the end of the program. Okay, uh, d just so you know, um, derivatives are definitely regulated, but they are not regulated as a functional. They are regulated institutionally. All right. Meaning that for our members who are our banks, they are, their derivatives activity are regulated by the, the Federal Reserve System and uh -huh. office, also the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Uh -huh. And having been in commercial banks for the past 10 years, I can tell you that their, their viewpoint or their, their regulation is quite thorough. I mean, right. They do understand the business. They come in, they ask the right questions, and so there is definitely supervision. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the, the securities firms you know, through the, the SEC, mm -hmm. th they are also being supervised. All right. Now, one of the things and that... You, you want to do uh, testify before these people and keep them informed of the reality? Well, that's... Your association helps to do that and what, make that government that's one of uh, the, uh, understanding. Not only does the industry work together to resolve documentation errors, uh, documentation development, one of the great things that people found is working together it was a great educational forum not only you know f for other financial institutions or corporations but also for the regulatory community uh -huh, uh -huh. and in general the, the regulatory community has been very favorable on how the derivatives business is being monitored okay. they do not see any need for any f greater supervision than the current system already has. All right, and then those are built in there. But this is one of the things that the association, one of the benefits of the association, is that you can help inform um, uh, people in the regulatory industry of the realities as they're emerging, and also this role of helping to educate the people within the financial uh, arena, as it were, to, to the new realities, new contractual agreements that have been worked out, you know, master agreements plus, mm -hmm. as it were, by the association, uh, keeping the internal uh, nature of the industry well uh, understood. And one last function, perhaps, that maybe we've tried to serve a little bit here today is to educate in some small way uh, the general society to a phenomena in the uh, financial arrangements of our society, even though it is not you know, retail, as we say, it's wholesale and financial institution, has a tremendous effect upon the, uh, the overall functioning of our economy, lowers the costs of uh, doing business, which can be passed on to the consumer and so forth. Indeed so it, it has is. a major effect. And we've tried to help share some of the excitement of the swaps and derivative story, as it were, with a, a modern success story in the financial market uh, arrangement of our society here on this program with the General Society. And I really thank you very much for coming oh, well, in and sharing so that much. with us. thank you so much. It was a great and experience. It's thank been you. a great <laughs> pleasure talking with you. And I would remind you in the audience, it's been your pleasure to have perceptions in, again, Carolyn Jackson. She's executive, uh, relatively newly appointed executive director of the exciting institution, the International Swaps and Derivatives Association Incorporated located here in New York, so we'll give you their address as we go out, and uh, we'd like to, th I thank you again, Carolyn, thank very you. much for coming in. It's been a great pleasure talking with you. We invite you to tune in next week. We'll be coming back at that time, so until next time, then, we'll see you next time. Bye. Okay. Now, we just sit for a minute. They're gonna oh, there's so many things we could talk about. I know. You had a number of things. You're really, you're really you're very articulate, you know. It makes Good. it very easy for you to, to follow. You really read that literature. Yeah. Oh, yes. We've read the literature. And it's very interesting, and there should. I think it's. I think it's something that the general society would be very interested in. You know. I mean, the general. You know, the viewing public. I don't know if they can follow it all or something, but there'd be more of a role for having the general public understand that. And those figures that you give are absolutely staggering. Those notational figures are just. I mean, that's like the gross national product of the world or something. You know. I mean, it seems like everything is wrapped up in that. It, but you want to take one or two percent of that in order right, to have it be the risk. Real, right. Yeah. But and then a forty-seven percent growth rate—that's amazing. So this year, what 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 would be the level of the deals that are going to be done? Let's say if you project for nineteen ninety-five, you know, what would that figure be? That trillion-dollar figure or whatever? Can you oh, make a projection? Oh, outstanding. 
Hmm. I would probably want to say about 15. 15? The, the problem, really? that that's doesn't mean that's amazing. what the growth rate was no, because no. what happens in outstanding, a, a lot of contracts mature. Uh -huh. What I think would have been an interesting number is if we could have tracked the total notional principle of all contracts written since its inception. That wow. Would, that would be much bigger. Have you done that? Has that been done? No, because it's, it's a hard thing to yeah. get to measure right. because people haven't traditionally in their systems kept track of the deals that have matured and the deals that are alive and, and, and on record. I see, right, right.